Who has a question ready here? Does the hand and the feet movement ever stop? At supper tables, at desks, does it always continue to go? Man, just like Rich, I'm always seeing stuff, man. And he hit a good point. It's sad, but we put the time in and we practice. But I'm married with two kids, 11 and 6 year olds. So I'm a dad, dude. You know what that's like. You think it's all glamorous, you come off the tour bus, I'm a hero. I just played for 10,000. Guess what I get from the wife? The kitchen's trash. <laughs> um, Cameron, my daughter, has baseball or softball practice, and they card us so you pick up the boys and girls club before six because they charge a dollar a minute after six. So, but I'm a rock star. I'm going to play Shelton, man. So no, it never stops, and we're always six. So that's our practice, you know? Sometimes, like, man, you hear, I, I love hearing Rich's stuff on the radio, man. To have that connection and, like, all right, I think we had a question over here. Steve, how many takes did Rain King take? Um, Rain King uh, probably would have taken less except that we recorded it as a band. And uh, it was very important uh, for Adam that, uh, that we recorded a bunch of times. <laughs> Every song we recorded on record was recorded like 25 times. Uh, and so the thing about Rain King is that we've been playing it a long time. And so we all had our parts and we got together with Tebow Burnett, the producer. And he started taking things out and changing things and really uh, stopping us from, uh, from recreating our old parts and creating new parts. And so he did a good job. So in Nashville, we probably would have been two or three times. But as it was back then, we did it about 30 times. <laughs> Who else has a question? Brett, um, what do you have uh, for like aspiring artists like that's coming out of church, but want to hit, you know, like for major artists and all like that? You want to get before major artists or more exposure? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Coming out of church. Um, <clears throat> wow. Well, do you want to be solely gospel? I guess that's the question. Uh, no. You don't want to be solely gospel? No. More inspirational? Uh, pretty much like almost every genre. I mean, I want okay. to do something. You know. Well, this is the thing you have to to remember with gospel, and this is just my opinion, so don't write this down in Sharpie. Um, everybody doesn't listen to gospel. That's where you start. <clears throat> um, not that you take away from the value of what the message is at all, because I'm, I'm a firm believer that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. That's just me. You know, I don't take away from what anybody else believes, but if you want to be introduced to a broader audience, don't classify yourself genre specific. If you want to be um, like, okay, for instance, Jay-Z, there's a lot of people that don't like or listen to him, but he said, okay, how do I get those fans? You know what I mean? Like, how do I, you know, um, travel over into different demographics and genres and then you look and he's on stage with Linkin Park or U2 and it's smart you know what I mean because it introduces your music to people who would n not normally search for you or want to hear what you have to say true story we were in Australia again and she's probably like 55 60 year old white lady came up to us we were coming out of the casino the band just, and she said, you know, I saw you guys on tour with you two. I would have never listened to Jay-Z before, but you guys put on an amazing show. And it's like, okay, that's the key. You, you, wanna, you wanna introduce your music to a broader audience. Don't say coming out of church. Don't say, listen, I'm an artist, I'm a musician. I have songs, I write songs and I want people to hear them. If you want the world to sing your songs, you can't stay in a genre lane. Genre is not, broad scale. Thank you. You understand what I mean? It's like you, you want more people to hear what you have to say? Then invite everybody to hear what you have to say. And make it... Uh, a lot of music is offensive in certain ways. Um, uh, you have to make sure that it's, it's friendly. You know? It's not... It's not um, it doesn't cut a certain demographic of people off or it doesn't degrade people or it doesn't offend. You know, and then you'll gather a broader audience of people who want to hear what you have to say because now, not only is your music good, 
hopefully your music is great, but your message is everybody friendly. And so now you have great music with a great message, and now you have somebody from Italy who heard your song and is like, I don't even really speak English, but it just felt great. You know what I mean? Uh, my question is, was it always clear that you, you wanted to drum, or did at any point, like, at any point did you like more than one instrument? Um, else have we all kind of bang around on other things. <laughs> Literally. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, I want, I mean I, I'm flirting with the guitar aspect, messing with that. And it's so funny, to, the look that I would get from my guitar player. Hey, dude, can you show me some chords? <laughs> really? <laughs> it's like, no, seriously. But, you know, we, in, yeah, as percussionists in school, you played the marimba. You played the vibes. You did all that stuff, timpani, whatever. But um, I think it makes us a better musician, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Because as drummers, we get that stigma, man. Oh, you just hit stuff. It's prevalent in the clubs. Not so much where we are, but we, there, there's still some of those guys that didn't get, they don't get it. And you have to know stuff. Like, I don't know notes, but I know, hey, man, if you played this part, I'm in a, a, that group trip to funk, and we come up with cool things, and I can't say, man, if it's a seven over nine and this, mm -hmm. but I'm like, I'll sing it very poorly. But, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's that. So don't think that because you can't pick up something and play it that you don't limit yourself, but use that as motivation to go to that instrument, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know, I'll speak for myself. When I first saw a drum set, that was pretty much it for me. I'm still surprised that everybody doesn't play drums. <laughs> it sure would make the world a lot easier to play with people, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, a that lot louder. guitar player is so on top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it sure does help to speak the language of music. So if you're, mm. you know, working with singers, songwriters, and bands, yep. you should know what intros are, verses are, pre-choruses, choruses, turnarounds, breaks and downs, tags. You know, you gotta, and if you can read music, that's always a, a plus. My my uh, preaching to all my students is: Look, at this will save your hide time and time and time again. <laughs> How can you go out with a band that calls you the night before and said, "Hey, man, our drummer broke his arm"? If you don't, there's no way you're gonna learn all the songs without being able to scribble down some cheat sheets. So that has saved me time and time again. And for me, I'm a strong collaborator. So when I songwrite, I make sure that I write with a really strong guitar player. And maybe with somebody that um, that's has their own studio, and then I bring my hand drum and all my rhymes and all my stories, and by collaborating, we have a song together. But I'm never going to be the guy that's going to pick up a guitar like James Taylor and, and write these poetic tales. Yeah. That what that's not my calling in life. This is my calling in life. But as soon as I learned about the um, the the atrocities of where the money goes in the music business, you have to write songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a really uh, cool but sobering conversation with Sterling Campbell about a month ago um, about the way it used to be and then with file sharing and everything and the way the business is now. Uh, where do either of you four guys see that going? Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm kind of happy that I didn't have my great success in the 80s because it would have been all velvet ropes and, and um, caviar and, and all that. And because I, I, there's guys that have had their, their, their success in the 80s, and they're having a really hard time adjusting. My success is coming now, after all these years, and I'm, I'm multitasking and working very, very hard 18-hour days. Every hour, every day is just reality for me. I never knew it any other way. But I know that there are people that are having a hard time adjusting to the changes. But in this new music model, you have to, to, to multitask. You, you have to tour. You have to record. I jumped into production and songwriting, and um, I'm pr fairly comfortable speaking. So I've turned that into a whole other side career for myself. So it's really the people that roll up their sleeves and say, I got this. In this new music business, you can make a living. You just have to do more than one thing. You know? I think with the file sharing, just like anything, I'm not going to walk up to you and give you $1,000 and just say, here. You know, so you adjust to the parameters of what's going on around you. If, if everybody's... I know, I know it was taking a lot of money out of an artist's pocket, you know, when people were not buying their music and they were, uh, you know, putting it on Napster for a while and different, you know, sites and just downloading everything for free. Um, my father always taught me, figure it out, you know, figure out a way to keep doing what you're doing, uh, make it happen. There's really no, I mean, 
to musicians who care, there's a right and wrong. Don't steal my stuff, don't share my files. I don't, I don't want it to be released before it's supposed to be, yeah. If it happens, it's advertisement. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? Like you may not make as much money as you want it off of it. Somebody may get a sour mix or something that you didn't intend to be released to the public. Somebody took your music because they liked it. You know, they stole your music and they put it on their site or they released it to a bunch of people. But you know, if you look at everything as gray, then you'll never see the colors in light. You know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna get mad because people are releasing my music for free all over the world. They're singing my songs all over the world, you know? I, I've never been rich. So I'm not, you know, I'm not missing anything right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I've always hustled. I've always got my hands dirty. I've always done these things. So if the world is out there singing a song that I wrote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have time for one more if anyone, yes. What was it like the first time you heard yourself on the radio? Woo. I'm still Steve, waiting. Steve, probably. I'll tell you, because I've actually thought about this. <laughs> um, the, uh, I get to, you know, I, I haven't been on that many songs that are on the radio, but I've been on a few. And it happened just the other day in a gas station bathroom. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and every time, it's the same thing. And it's kind of like seeing yourself, a reflection of yourself. There's this little weird moment of dizziness where you're like, oh. And, and it happens to me all the time, like at a grocery store, I'll have this little moment of like confusion and, and think, what? Oh, oh, that's a song I played on, you know. And I'll tell you what, it always feels great. It always picks me up and, mm. and I hope it happens forever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I remember hearing Rain King, you know. And being in a band down and playing Lower Broadway and, and learning Steve Bowman drum parts, and now we're friends. And so it's really funny mm. where this journey of life will take you. You know, it's um, we know we have a similar story about a young drummer that I met. You know, uh, what was it? Uh, six, seventeen years ago or something you like that. It. You know, <laughs> I do know the first time that my little best friends, our rhythm section, heard ourselves on the radio. We were driving down uh, uh, I-65 in Nashville, and I tell you what, three grown men. Cry. Yeah. <laughs> because mm. it was our dream mm. in life. And when your dreams come to fruition, it's a very, very powerful thing. Yeah. And it's never yeah. too late for that to happen. Yeah. You, you a, a life without dreams, you might as well pack it up. You, everybody has a dream. And so for my, that was one of my dreams is that, yeah, that's my tambourine. Even like on something simple like a Trace Atkins song, and I go, you listen, you're like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's my tambourine. That's the golden tambourine. It's awesome. Nowadays, we're confused if we don't hear Rich on the radio. It's like, what's the... <laughs> I'm living vicariously through these guys. Like, man, that was a really cool groove they played. That was so awesome. And, and so it's... And with our journey together, and it, 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 I'm so proud that we're like... We're becoming, in Nashville, the, the seasoned guys. Yeah. And we were the guys, yeah, we were the guys that, it was funny, after the CMA Awards one year, there was this big party at Warner Brothers, which I used to crash those parties. Yes. I couldn't get in, but I so knew someone that knew someone that got me through the back door to go. Well, then I go to this thing, and they're running, Blake did an All About Tonight live DVD, and they're playing it for this party, and that's me. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I couldn't get into this thing before, and look at me, I wanted to grab everybody, that's me, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it was awesome. <laughs> With the red tie? Yes, of course. Yeah. Who would wear that in public anyway? Sleeve the shirt and red tie? That's a bad there's, choice, man. There's something they say about guys in Nashville. They say that the studio guys play a song the first time like they've been playing it all their life. And then the road guys can play the same song all their life like it's the first time. And those mm -hmm. are both yeah. really yeah. incredible skills, you know. Yeah. Some guys... Do both ways, right? Well, we need to call Blake yeah. and give him a good shake it and go, what? The well, I mean, we got lucky in the band Trip to Funk. I hate to be pushing it, but he, he always called it the wrong name on purpose because he always, if you know Blake, you know he's a prankster. He's, a <laughs> he's like, so that band you guys have, that Trifuncta, <laughs> that thing, that little band you have, well, I'm doing this Christmas album, and I want y'all to write some songs. Not that crazy crap you guys play with Trifuncta, <laughs> but like some different things. 
<laughs> so then bass player, guitar player, and I, we're like, and we did this all in a month while we were on the road. Like everybody, we had an interface, laptop. We just went in dressing rooms and put down demos. We did some straight up jazz stuff. Well, it was like he wanted original stuff. So we did some straight up jazz stuff. We did some Western swing stuff. We did some mid 80s Conway Twitty type stuff. We did all kinds of things. And we found out that about a month ago, he was cutting two of our songs on yeah. his Christmas album. Yeah. And so, You're on the record. I'm excited about that. 